Hello everyone. My name is Larry Novak and today we will be discussing the Practicing Engineer's Guide to Designing by Strut and Tile Modeling. And what I mean by that, I really mean it from the point of view of the designer, not the point of view of taking a class or teaching a class on it. Really, what does one need to know to use it in practice? <clears throat> And again, my name is Larry Novak. I am a licensed structural engineer. I'm also a fellow of the American Concrete Institute and a fellow of the Structural Engineering Institute and a lead accredited professional. I'm the senior director of structural engineering and codes for the Portland Cement Association. But I've done a lot of work on the strut and tie model to get it into the code in the form that it is now. So we're going to talk a little bit today about behavior structures, the code requirements and model development, and we'll even go through a worked example. But I really want to emphasize behavior because that is the key to strut and time modeling. Um, what the buildings you see on the screen here, Trump Tower Chicago, as well as the Burj Khalifa, I was involved in their design, and both heavily relied on strut and time models for their design. So let's take a step back and talk about how does a reinforced concrete beam behave. So we're going to take a look at a simple model here, which takes a wood beam that has a hole drilled through it vertically right along this red dashed line. And through that hole, we've strung a bungee cord with knots on top and bottom. And then we came along also and saw cut along this line, not cutting the bungee cord, along the black line, so this is a break. And at the top, we have a little brass hinge representing the compression zone. And so this is symmetric. We have a support here. Imagine a support far to the, your right. And we have a point for loading here on the hook. So when we give a pull down on the hook, you can see that the crack opens up. And the bungee cord gets stretched by the amount of that crack opening. And that is literally what's happening with a stirrup in a reinforced concrete beam. And that we may have seen in school or may have never even seen it in this mechanism, but let's take it one step further and overlay on this a truss to show what's really happening. So what we've got going on is the load in red intention comes up the load, comes down in a green compression strut, comes up in tension along the bungee cord because that's the only load that can transfer along that crack, and then in compression down to support. And we still have a compression part here of our truss, so that's in the hinge. So literally this is statically determinant and easy to follow the load paths, and there is only one possible load path across that crack. And that's what stirrups do. They lift the load back up so it can come down diagonally in compression in the concrete. And this is really the entire behavior of a strut and a stirrup is a strut and tie approach. Let's take a look at what we'd call a deep beam. Um, the definition of a deep beam was updated in ACI 318.11 to have a consistent definition of span to depth ratio of four which means a beam is kind of stocky. Now, why do we specifically talk about deep beams? Well, the strut and tie method in the code is applicable for anything, and we'll talk a lot more about that. But for deep beams, it is currently the only game in town. Currently, what's in the code, it says in these two sections, in 9912, deep beams shall be designed taking into account this is a mouthful, I apologize for reading, but I want to go through it. Nonlinear distribution of longitudinal strange over the depth of the beam. Well, that means our elastic program won't, can't solve it. Even our inelastic software won't solve it unless it includes cracking. And then it has to include slip of the bar, material nonlinearity, geometric nonlinearity, we're talking about software packages that most universities do not have access to, like Abacus and Vector. 
And certainly, even if we had access to those and could run them on our PC on our desk, would we really want to go through that level of analysis for every beam that's a deep beam or a corbel or anything like that? It would be physically limiting to the structural engineer.